Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, family and friends. My name is Colonel Evangeline Roselle and I will be your narrator for today's retirement ceremony. Today we celebrate the career and accomplishments of General Joseph L. Votel, United States Army. A retirement ceremony is intended to convey a grateful nation's sincere expression of appreciation for a job well done and to officially recognize General Votel and his family for their 39 years of faithful and honorable service to our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party. Please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Mr. Ryan McCardle, followed by the invocation by our command chaplain, Colonel Eric Albertson. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon our retirement ceremony today that honors our friend, fellow warrior, and commander, General Joseph Votel, as we take a brief moment in time to acknowledge his years of selfless dedication to the United States military and the nation it defends, and to simply express our gratitude for his generous gift of life, service, and love for the troops and civilians he has commanded his relentless commitment to the demanding CENTCOM mission, as well as his remarkable leadership in multiple challenging assignments throughout his 39 years of distinguished service, firmly established a legacy of success, inspiring countless future leaders, dramatically influencing their careers in a powerful way and setting the stage for future success long after his departure from service. We also ask your special blessing upon his family especially his wife, Michelle, for they have generously supported his many years of service with their own sacrifices, but most importantly, with their love and understanding. May your grace, which has been present and evident throughout his life, also bring him peace and joy in retirement, knowing that his devotion to duty will forever be appreciated by a grateful nation, by the entire CENTCOM community here in Tampa, and by the many countries who have benefited from his commitment to regional stability and the perpetual defense of freedom. In your holy name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Mr. McArdle and Chaplain Albertson. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Today, we are all a part of history as we witness the retirement ceremony honoring General Joseph Fotel for his remarkable time in service. We are extremely honored to have joining us for today's ceremony, the Honorable Patrick M. Shanahan, Acting Secretary of Defense, General Joseph F. Dunford, Jr., Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark A. Milley, Chief of Staff of the Army and presiding official for today's ceremony. Additionally, we would like to welcome our distinguished guests, representatives of the many nations with whom we are proud to partner with in the Levant, Arabian Peninsula, and Central and South Asia, as well as members of the diplomatic corps, interagency, and senior leaders of the federal, military, and civilian communities. And let us not forget to welcome our Central Command families who truly carry the heaviest load and enable us to do the important work that we do. We would like to welcome all the guests who have traveled great lengths to be part of this momentous occasion, to include the members of the Youth Make Class of 1980. Go Army! <laughs> and our warmest welcome to Mrs. Michelle Votel and General and Mrs. Votel's two sons, Nicholas and Scott, his wife, Maura, and their granddaughter, Penelope. It is my honor to introduce the presiding official for General Votel's retirement ceremony, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General Mark A. Milley. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. And this is uh, quite a day. And as I got off the plane there at McDill, I get met by Eric Carrillo, a force of nature in his own right. And he says, Sir, we're looking forward to this. This is going to be epic. Get the 40 years off your chest when you get that microphone. <laughs> and my wife said, don't do that. There's going to be 750 to 1,000 people there. There'll be cameras. And in D.C., they call that evidence, so be careful. <laughs> so, Joe, uh, most of what I say will be true, some of which uh, perhaps may not be. So just deal with it there, Ranger. <laughs> and, 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 of course, today we all know that Rangers lead the way. But special forces taught them how. <laughs> that's, that's to make up for my brown beret, green beret thing. So, hey, look, at, uh, good afternoon and welcome uh, to everyone. We've, uh, we're here to honor uh, Joe and Michelle and, and Scott and Nick uh, and, and really the extended Votel family today uh, for an incredible run of uh, four decades, really, of, of consecutive service. You had West Point in there, it's really 43 years. Uh, of uh, consecutive service. And we do have an honored crowd from the class of 1980, Pride and Excellence. That's my class. I was in I-3. I was in the same squad. I was there. I was made, actually made an honorary member, and Votel said, you have to walk an hour on the area. So I did that. And with the powers invested in me as chief, I gave myself amnesty. So Joe, I, a cadet will not lie, cheat or steal, I have to confess to that, but it's, it's a great day. And I want to do also acknowledge we have a huge amount of dignitaries here. Uh, and, and Acting Secretary uh, Shanahan, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Joe Dunford and his great wife, Ellen. Uh, there's lots of four stars here, lots of uh, current and former combatant commanders, lots of ambassadors, lots of sergeant majors and general officers. Thank you all uh, for being here. And, and, and really, I think it's important, I suppose, to uh, acknowledge uh, some people who put this together. Uh, Joe's going to do that, uh, but one group that I want to acknowledge uh, are the Gold Star families uh, that are here. And if you could uh, rise uh, to be recognized, thank you so much for being here. And of course, we want to uh, welcome Joe's family. Uh, he's uh, been an exceptional soldier for many, many years. And uh, yes, uh, some of it is his responsibility. But in fact, 
Uh, he, like all of us, a product of other people. We all rise to these ranks on the shoulders of heroes, uh, non-commissioned officers, officers, soldiers, but also uh, on our family's uh, shoulders. And Joe Votel is no different. Uh, he is one of nine children, the youngest of six brothers uh, and uh, three girls uh, who grew up in the Twin Cities of St. Paul, Minnesota. In fact, uh, Joe is the only guy that I know from Minnesota who doesn't know how to play hockey. <laughs> and uh, most of his brothers and sisters are here. In fact, uh, almost all of Minnesota is in here today, so that's good. <laughs> Joe's mother and father unfortunately passed away, uh, and they couldn't be with us here, but they are definitely here uh, in spirit. And I know, Joe, that they are very, very proud of you and all that you've done. They were incredible role models uh, for the entire family. They instilled uh, Joe with a, a sense of values of duty and service and, and serving a cause greater than himself. And Joe, everyone here knows that your parents are with you today and they are here to honor your service and we thank them for giving us you. And of course, Joe, uh, 39 years ago uh, will be the anniversary uh, for Joe and Michelle, and we need to thank uh, Michelle because our spouses, as much or more uh, than our sacrifice over the years to support our service in uniform. And Michelle and Joe have been married now for almost four decades, and they have an anniversary, as I mentioned, coming up next month. And it's interesting because it's not exactly uh, the marriage made in heaven is how they met sort of thing. In fact, uh, Michelle had her eyes on another guy. <laughs> Joe was the alternate pick. <laughs> Actually, he was number three. <laughs> he was number three on the OML. This is true. I swear to God, this is true. So, uh, he was number three on the OML, and Joe, ever the tactician, uh, he decided to, to jump on it, swooped in, saw the opening, seized the objective. Uh, he did it with violence and, and, and all of that, and he went to the dance with Michelle. And after that, 39 years later, here we are. So uh, what, a, what a story. And thank you, Michelle, for sharing that with me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't su Shame on me. I'm not supposed to acknowledge sources. I know. I'm, I'm in a group of, you know, the former CIA people, the special forces. No, you can't acknowledge sources. I'm sorry, Michelle. I, I'm sorry. But Michelle's a woman of many talents, and she's done tremendous selfless work at every duty station she has ever served for 38 years uh, by Joe's side, almost 39 now. They've made 24 PCS moves over the years, and, and she's dealt with the deployments, the training, the combat, and all the other challenges uh, that come with military life. She's been a devoted volunteer, not only of Army organizations, but since 2008, she's been a passionate supporter of the National Marrow Donor Program, a nonprofit organization focusing on research and treatment of life-threatening illnesses like leukemia. She's also been an Arlington lady since 2004, honoring our fallen at our national cemetery in that solemn ground. She's been a Little League coach, a soccer coach, a Cub Scout leader, and above all, a tremendous mother of two wonderful sons. Michelle, thank you. On behalf of all of us here and those that couldn't make it here, thank you for your service. Thank you for supporting Joe for all of these years. We love you and thank you so much. And of course, uh, as mentioned uh, early on, uh, Scott and Nick are here, uh, Joe and Michelle's uh, two sons. Uh, we welcome both of you. Uh, we know that you are proud of your mom and dad, and, and we're all glad that you could make it here today. Scott uh, is an English professor. He teaches up at Suffolk University in the Holy Land of Massachusetts. <laughs> and Nick is a professional chef and is studying to get his business degree at UNC Wilmington and he plans very soon to open up a food and restaurant logistics business uh, in the coming months. You know, our children, all of us in uniform, regardless of rank, our children go through tremendous hardships so that we can serve, and, and we absolutely couldn't do what we do uh, without your unconditional love and your support. And I know that your mom and dad, and especially your dad, appreciates all the sacrifice that you've done over the years and all that you've done to support him. So thanks to both of you for being two great sons.
So back to Carilla. <laughs> Joe, I have had an opportunity over the last several weeks in, in doing deep research on your background. And, and I've had an opportunity to speak to probably pretty much everyone in this room. And uh, there's one guy in the room who actually went to grade school with you and then high school, and I can't divulge the nature of the source. But he asked me to mention some high school party at some church that you went to. And then he said, full stop. So I will go full stop. And I know that the class of 1980 is here. And Joe and I, of course, were in I-3, first squad, I think, as that, as I recall. Yep, and, uh, and, and Joe and I, uh, we, didn't, we weren't roommates, we were in the same hall and uh, got in trouble a little bit. And I always remember that one of the things, this is kind of weird, but one of the things that, that Joe really liked was that old YMCA song. <laughs> I'm sorry. A actually, Thomas gave me that one. I didn't make that up. So, and as you recall, uh, Joe, Joe and I went to Ranger School together back in the day. And, uh, and, and Joe, of course, you know, Mr. Ranger, right? You know, 75th Range and 175, Re Ranger Regiment, puts his knees in the breeze over Afghanistan right at the beginning, all that kind of stuff, right? So Joe is like a consummate Ranger. And there he is in Dahlonega, and Tony Thomas is carrying his ruck up the mountain. <laughs> and I, I was carrying his radio, by the way. So <laughs> it's true, swear to God. And then I had an opportunity to watch Joe. Uh, as we switched out DCG jobs in Afghanistan one time. And, and Joe is very, very health conscious. I mean, he is like a machine, right? And Joe had 12 peanuts. 12. It wasn't 11, it wasn't 30, it was 12. And I looked at Joe and my eyes are big. I'm like, Joe, what's up, man? He had them all lined up and stuff like that. 12 peanuts. He, Joe is the total machine. In fact, uh, when he's at home, according to his two sons as alternate sources, I won't tell which one said this, but Joe goes around and calls himself the total system. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't mean to be doing this. Someone wrote it and I just read it. So, so then I had the opportunity to be an observer controller for Joe when Joe committed 175 at, at Joint Readiness Training Center. Paula Cameron, the current commander of 18th Airborne Corps, was S3. And, of course, Stanley McChrystal, who's not here today, but he sends his best, by the way. Uh, he was the uh, regimental commander. And Stan McChrystal had this thing. They were introducing a new little computer system. You probably remember this. Introduced a little, new little computer system, and, and, and Stan McChrystal wanted to make sure that you were using your computer system. So he had some kind of weird way to monitor your use. And, of course, Joe had Specialist Jones take the mouse and move it every once in a while. <laughs> Je these are things only an OC would know, right? So, <laughs> hey, look, in all seriousness, uh, Joe Votel is, in my view, and I've known him now for four decades as well, and I know it's the same for everyone in this room, uh, Joe Votel is a comp consummate professional. Uh, he is the single most competent officer uh, that I've run into in uniform over the years. Uh, very, very few uh, people ever get to the rank of uh, four-star to begin with. Uh, and if you think about it, it's the same rank that General Blackjack Pershing had in World War I as he led the uh, American Expeditionary Forces in France. Uh, it's the same level of rank that uh, Eisenhower had at, at Normandy and beyond. Uh, and, and this is a big deal. And, and back in 1980, <laughs> West Point, what am I going to do? So back in 1980, <laughs> that's good. See, we rehearsed this earlier. So back in the day, 5,688 officers were commissioned second lieutenants in the class of 1980. And of those, six of them became four-star generals. And if you do the math, and I didn't go to West Point in reality, uh, and they teach math at West Point, but if you do the math, I went on Siri and got this, it comes out to 0.0001% chance of becoming a four-star general. And that's, a, that's an actual fact. So to put that in perspective, uh, you're more likely to be struck by lightning twice walking out of this building than you are to wear the rank of a four-star general. In fact, Joe doesn't pay, play golf. Uh, he does a lot of things, but golf and hockey are not one of them. And you actually stand a better chance of going to a golf course this afternoon and watching Joe Votel hit two holes in one consecutively than he is to be a four-star general. It's amazing. And in fact, 
it's about the same chance of being a four-star general as it is for Joe's vaunted Minnesota Vikings to even get close. <laughs> I mean, are they even a team anymore? <laughs> it's all about the Patriots, brother. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but you may think I'm making it up. Those stats are actually true, and it's very, very rare. It's very, very rare. And how do you, how do, you do it? How does a guy like Joe Votel, family of nine, Twin Cities, I go to West Point, how does he sort of beat the odds, I suppose, and become a four-star general? And I would argue there were two things, uh, and, uh, and I think many would agree, uh, that it's fundamentally a derivative of competence uh, and character. And in Joe Votel, uh, he has absolutely shined. He's demonstrated his competence uh, over and over and over again. In fact, the first time he demonstrated his competence was many, many years ago when he applied to both the United States Naval Academy and West Point. And he got into both. And he went down to Navy, and he said, and he concluded when he came out of the Naval Academy uh, recruiting weekend, and, and he said, look it, I like the Navy, I like the Army, but the Navy is a good alternative to military service, so I'm going to West Point. <laughs> I, know, I know there's admirals in the room. I'm, McRaven, Olsen, I'm sorry, I swear. I, <laughs> Samansky, you're out there, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, he demonstrated his exceptional competence in 3ID as a, as a young officer, platoon leader, company commander. He goes off, he's an S3 and 175, then he commands uh, the Rangers, 1st Ranger Battalion after he takes command of uh, Triple Deuce up in 10th Mountain Division. Uh, 75th Ranger Regiment, of course, he's the first guy out the door uh, shortly after 911 going into Afghanistan. Uh, he commanded Jaido. Uh, many, many people may not realize that, the Joint IED Task Force up in the Department of Defense, DCG of the 82nd, DCG of JSOC, Chief of Staff of SOCOM, Commander JSOC, and did all kinds of wonderful things for our nation, Commander SOCOM, and now, of course, most recently, and about to give up command of Central Command. You just don't do that litany of jobs. You just don't do that unless you are highly competent and highly competitive and have exceptional character. In, in fact, at CENTCOM, since March of six 16, uh, Joe's had an impact that very few will ever have in the national security of the United States. Under his command, Central Command uh, led the 79-member coalition to defeat ISIS in Iraq and Syria and to territorially take away uh, their caliphate, uh, supporting airstrikes against terrorist cells in Yemen and uh, leading a 41-nation mission in Afghanistan, promoting the security in that troubled country. And then, of course, maritime operations uh, throughout the region, throughout the AOR, uh, specifically in Straits of Hormuz and elsewhere. CENTCOM has maintained regional relationships, and many of our allied partners are here today, like Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and in 2018, conducted the first operational deployment of the F-35, solidifying and demonstrating U.S. air supremacy against any opponent in the Middle East. Joe brought knowledge, experience. He brought fresh perspective and genuine care for the soldiers that very, very few could ever match. And he brought a steady hand to probably the world's most complex environment. In my view, and for what it's worth, I think that Joe was the absolutely the right general at the right time. Uh, and he's leaving this organization better than the way he found it. Joe's career is full of impressive accomplishment. He served in war and peace. And no matter what, no matter what the challenge, no matter how high the mountain, no matter how wide the river, Joe managed to cross it in every single case, and he did it with excellence. 30 months of combat time, 30 months. It took nine months from D-Day to the fall of Berlin. Joe Votel has spent 30 months in combat. He's commanded 180 months, 15 years of command. His competence is off the charts. But it's character, not just competence, that gives a guy like Joe Votel the reputation that he's so dearly earned. It's the only quality, in fact, in my mind, that actually got him here, is his character. He has tremendous character, starting with integrity. He always speaks truth to power. He cares about the soldiers, and he's not about himself. He cares about his country. He cares about the opportunity to train young leaders. He is a guy who always uses the word we and us and our and he never, ever says I and me unless something's gone wrong and he's taken full responsibility. 
He's the honest broker. He always provides professional analysis. But above all, Joe Votel has never forgotten where he came from. Above all, Joe Votel is humble. He's accomplished many things in his career, and he certainly could beat his chest, but he doesn't. He understands it's not about him. It's about the team. And that's so uncommon today. Too often, we see celebrities and officials and, and leaders who think it's about them. They can't pass a mirror without looking at themselves, and they don't understand the simple act of humility, and they're very guilty of what I would call hubris, the ancient crime in ancient Greece. But Joe knows the secret. He knows the secret to destroy the disease of hubris. He knows what the anecdote is, and he knows that anecdote is the simple act of daily humility. Despite his success, Joe has always remembered the value of hard work, the value of service to others, the value that his mother and father and his brothers and sisters put him in at an early age. He's never lost sight of what's truly important. And he knows that from dust to dust he came and unto dust he shall return. He has used humility to keep himself grounded, to train and to care for the thousands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who's crossed his path. So Joe, you've had a long and incredibly successful career. You've demonstrated yourself to be a man of tremendous talent, physical courage, unwavering moral courage, and true leadership. Through all those years deployed, through all the PCS moves, through 39 years of training, preparing for combat, and actually fighting in close quarters battle, you have been an incredible, true professional and warrior. And we wish, everyone here wishes, that you and Michelle will have a happy retirement wherever life's road takes you. We all want you to enjoy some peace and quiet, go back to the family and friends in Minnesota, head up to the lake, and get over to the U.S. Stadium and watch the Vikings practice. <laughs> I didn't write that. That was, that was inserted. But Joe, whatever you do, know that you've impacted all of us in this room and that you've impacted many, many thousands beyond this room. There are NCOs, there are officers in all the branches of our service who look to you forever as their leader. And there's people that you shaped that will be in our Army and our Joint Force for many, many years and decades to come. Holly Ann and I, on behalf of everyone in this room, we're honored to have served alongside both you and Michelle. We're honored to call you our friends. And we all in this room thank you for a lifetime of incredible service. Joe Votel, retired. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing as General Milley presents General Votel with his retirement award. Attention to orders. The Defense Distinguished Service Medal is presented to Joseph L. Votel, United States Army, who distinguished himself by exceptionally distinguished service as Commander, United States Central Command, from 30 March 2016 to 28 March 2019. General Votel's bold leadership and clear strategic vision guided multiple simultaneous military operations through a complex and tumultuous region vital to United States interests and national security. A visionary statesman, General Votel advanced a theater engagement strategy that built close rapport amongst the central region's political and military leaders, which informed the United States foreign and military policies and unified coalition governmental entities across 50 nations, enhancing security for millions of generations to come. The distinctive accomplishments of General Votel culminate a long and distinguished career in the service of his country and reflect great credit upon himself, the United States Army, and the Department of Defense. Signed, Patrick M. Shanahan, Acting Secretary of Defense.
General Milley will now present General Votel with his retirement certificate. Attention to orders. To all who shall see these presents greeting, this is to certify that General Joseph L. Votel, having served faithfully and honorably, is retired from the United States Army on the first day of May 2019. Signed, Mark A. Milley, General, United States Army, Chief of Staff. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Gunnery Sergeant Williams will now escort Mrs. Votel to the stage. General Milley will now present Mrs. Votel with her award, which reads, The Outstanding Public Service Award is presented to Mrs. Michelle Votel, who distinguished herself by exceptionally distinguished public service to the Department of Defense in a succession of extraordinary contributions to the United States Army, United States Central Command, their families, and the MacDill Air Force Base community from 30 March 2016 to 28 March 2019. Mrs. Votel's vision, organizational skills, and positive relationships with support agencies from the MacDill Air Force Base and the local community led to volunteers providing more than 2,600 hours to support educational seminars that strengthen families' resiliency and well-being. On numerous occasions, she was a keynote speaker at military and civilian venues, raising awareness of the challenges facing service members and their families. Mrs. Votel exemplifies the spirit of outstanding public service and is a role model for volunteerism whose leadership inspired others to acts of community service. The distinctive accomplishments of Mrs. Votel are in keeping with the finest traditions of public service and reflect great, reflect great credit upon herself, United States Central Command, the United States Army, and the Joint Staff. Signed, Joseph F. Dunford, Jr., General, United States Marine Corps, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Milley will now present Mrs. Votel with her Certificate of Appreciation, which reads, This is to certify that Michelle M. Votel, on the occasion of the retirement of your spouse from the United States Army, has earned grateful appreciation for your own unselfish, faithful, and devoted service. Your unfailing support and understanding helped to make possible your spouse's lasting contribution to the nation. Signed, Mark A. Milley, General, United States Army, Chief of Staff. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present General Joseph L. Votel, United States Army, retired. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Chief, for those uh, great comments. I'm ready to begin my rebuttal. 
I, I, you know, Tony and I were actually talking the other day. We remember that ranger school story just a little bit different. <laughs> I think I was carrying the rucksack, yours, and, uh, and Tony was carrying the, the M60 machine gun that you were supposed to be carrying. And, and we both agreed that that didn't really bother us. But what really bothered us was the crying in the patrol base. <laughs> <laughs> More on the chief in a few moments here. <laughs> hey, first off, I want to start off by acknowledging the, uh, uh, the contingent of the 82nd Airborne Division Band, All-American Band here that's with us today. Thanks, thanks guys. I want to also acknowledge our national anthem singer, uh, NCIS Special Agent Ryan McArdle. Now, yes, very good. A little bit of a story here. Uh, some time ago, uh, one of our erstwhile team members found a, uh, found a video on YouTube of Ryan, uh, and it, it appears that he's in a band. And uh, he's got a pretty good voice, as you can tell. Uh, so he was, uh, we got him singing, and then we researched, we found some more. So uh, Ryan has heard uh, our team play his videos dozens of times at inappropriate uh, locations and uh, occasions and other things here. Uh, but uh, I asked Ryan after I had heard this uh, that uh, if he'd come and sing at our at our at our retirement ceremony, and I think he thought I was kidding. I wasn't, and he came and he did a fantastic job, uh, as you all saw with our national anthem there. Although I, I do have to tell you, Ryan, a part of me was secretly th hoping that you would go into your Billy Idol mode, Idol mode, <laughs> and sing Rebel Yell here. So. Perhaps, perhaps in the in the time in between here, you can do that. And let me also acknowledge uh, Father Eric. Uh, thanks very much, Father, for your always inspiring words. Uh, Chief, thanks for giving us ca a Catholic chaplain here. We've uh, I, Michelle and I have been lobbying for like 20 years to get one, and uh, we we really appreciate that. We appreciate the great support from uh, from the Army here on that. So, thanks, uh, thanks very much. You should bless yourself. Um, <laughs> So a long time ago, an NCO that I trusted provided me some advice on public speaking. He basically said, as only an NCO can say in the very direct and unequivocal manner that we all come to expect from them, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> so the main thing today is this, that while I admit to being a little, a little bittersweetness uh, associated with ending this part of my life, my overwhelming emotion today is one of gratitude. I'm so thankful for having the opportunity to serve our nation for as long as I have. I'm so grateful for the people who have enabled that service. Many of those people are in this room. Others are not due to their continuing service uh, or other more important matters. Some have moved on to their final reward, and others, I am certain, know nothing about this ceremony, but have been so critical and influential to my service. Thank you all for being here for Michelle and me today. I will not try to acknowledge every key visitor today, but I must, miss a, uh, must mention a few. Mr. Secretary, thanks for joining us this afternoon. My family appreciates you being here, uh, yeah, but more importantly, we appreciate the heavy load that you carry on behalf of our nation every day, so thank you very much. Chairman Joe Dunford, thanks for your strong support over the, the last nearly five years of combatant command, and more importantly, your friendship that has transcended that period. Our nation is so lucky to have you in this position. Your steady, calm leadership has helped us weather a lot. William T. Sherman, in his letter to U.S. Grant when recalling their service together in the Western Campaign, wrote, and I quote, when you have completed your preparations, you go into battle without hesitation, as at Chattanooga, no doubts, no reserve, and I tell you that it was this that made us act with confidence. I knew wherever I was that you thought of me. And if I got in a tight spot, you would come, if alive. Chairman, thanks for being there for me and for our nation. We owe you and Ellen a debt of gratitude. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chief, thanks for officiating today. You were my first and only choice, although you didn't really give me much of a choice. <clears throat> what, what many of you don't know is the chief keeps a picture of our ranger school class uh, in his office. 
And each me as each member of Class 281 retires or departs service, uh, the chief puts a great big X right over their mug. <laughs> so whenever, whenever I visit his office, which is fairly frequently, I immediately go check the picture to make sure that he has not crossed me off yet. Uh, I admit, though, I am, uh, I am a bit sad that you will inev inevitably have to do this. Uh, you've been a good friend and a great confidant, and I will miss talking with you about our common challenges. Thanks for what you are stepping forward to do on behalf of our nation. You are the right man, and your experience, sheer handedness, uh, and blunt articulation of the challenges are exactly what we will require. Michelle and I wish you and Holly Ann Godspeed in the days and years ahead. There are a number of other colleagues, uniformed and civilian, senior and subordinate, officer and non-commissioned officer, and uh, present and civilians and present uh, today who have played a leading role in my development and who have always been extraordinary supporters of me. Names like Holland, Brown, Olson, McRaven, Daly, Friedovich, Maholland, Hart, Farrell, Rogers, Garrett, Plater, Foreman, James, Cook, to name but a few. To you and many others that are here and, and unable to attend, thank you. You have all set a great example, and I strove to emulate your superior leadership and human attributes. Mayor Bob Buckhorn, Swagger Six, thanks for making Tampa such a great place to serve. You have been magnificent, and all of those, uh, all of us who serve in uniform, owe you and your family, and indeed the broader civilian community of the Tampa Bay area, a great measure of thanks for your welcoming hospitality and the strong support to both U.S. and coalition forces and families who serve in the area. Good luck with your transition. I look forward to trading Uber tips with you. <laughs> we have friends and family who have come from all over the country uh, to be with us today. Thanks to all of you. I would especially like to recognize Sean Doyle and Bill Kramer. We went to St. Matthew's grade school together and went on to Creighton High School together in St. Paul. And we have remained close friends all of our lives. They know our kids and we know theirs. They are my oldest friends. Every year they plan and execute a summer fishing trip to Canada. I've been invited in the past but never had the opportunity to go. A few months ago, they called me and invited me to this summer's edition. For the first time since I can remember, I was able to commit without even having to check a calendar. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm looking forward to it. And I especially look forward to using my custom rangers lead the way uh, fishing pole that you have provided me. So thank you very much. Kim and Colleen, uh, great to have you with us. I will take care, good care of your husbands this summer. There is also a broader contingent of St. Paul supporters that includes high school classmates and good friends and neighbors. Thanks to all of you as well. John Traxler, thanks for being my personal public affairs officer back there in St. Paul and keeping our broader friends uh, informed on Michelle and, and me. Let me also give a big shout out to my West Point classmates, the Pride and Excellence class of 1980. Thanks for, thanks for being here. I really appreciate all of you being here today. I suspect your experience is the same as mine. West Point uh, was transformative for me in so many ways. It's hard to put into a few words uh, what that association common experience means, but it's clearly demonstrated by your presence and strong support today. As many of you know and have now heard, at our 35th reunion, we made the Chief of Staff an honorary classmate. I want to report to you, as you've, again, as you've witnessed here, that I've passed him just enough information to be able to credibly fake it. <laughs> Don't ask him too many questions, though, or you're likely to get a response more appropriate to somebody who went to Princeton, <laughs> which I think we all would agree was a good backup plan for West Point. <laughs> I'd especially like to acknowledge my, my fellow polar bears from Company I-3, the Terra North area. We were fortunate enough to be together for four straight years. If you look closely at one of the pictures in today's program, it is of us, many of us, during an alcohol-fueled hayride at the Hudson Valley Winery, one of my very favorite memories of our time together. You all know how much you mean to Michelle and I. Thanks for being here and for being with us throughout our service. Mark and Wendy Taylor, thanks for organizing this all so well. I'm a very lucky man, and I know it. For the last 39 years, I've had the love and support of a good woman. I've been bolstered by the support of a large and always proud family, and I've had the opportunity to serve a great nation in its time of need. And I've had the opportunity to walk among giants. 
No man could have asked for more. And in the vein of keeping the main thing, the main thing, I'm very grateful. My principal partner for the last 44 years has been Michelle, a member of the proverbial 2% club. My girlfriend before West Point, uh, transitioning to fiance twice, and then, and then my wife. She is the love of my life, and I readily acknowledge her as the best leader I have ever seen. The right mixture of hard and soft, able to combine empathy and motivation to not only connect in a direct and deeply personal way, but to build resilience in those she serves. She trusts her instincts. She uses her position for good and has always made it rewarding and positive for those we have served alongside. And she is taking good care of me and our kids. In our home, we have a framed picture given to us by a dear friend that quotes chapter 31 of the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible, describing a woman of valor. It is a perfect description of Michelle. In part, it says, a woman of valor, who can find? Her worth is above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and nothing shall he lack. She renders him good and not evil. All the days of her life, she opens her hand to the needy and extends her hand to the poor. She is robed in strength and dignity and cheerfully faces whatever may come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Her tongue is guided by kindness. She tends to the affairs of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. Her children come forward and bless her, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women, have, many women have done superbly, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a God-fearing woman is much to be praised. On Saturday evening, along with Bill and Allie Thetford, our good friends, we went to a concert by country music artist Brad Paisley. And among his repertoire that evening, he sang a very reflective song entitled, last time for everything. The last few weeks and months have brought many lasts for Michelle and me. But I know this, when one thing ends, another thing starts. So Michelle, I can never repay you for all that you've done for me and for our family, but it won't prevent me from trying. Tomorrow morning is a new start for us and I look forward to the next journey with you. I love you so much. Michelle and I have been blessed with two great sons, both fiercely independent and intent on charting their own paths. For Scott and Nicholas, your mom and I are so proud of you. Army life it was hard for you two, I know this. Once, when I took Scott to West Point to extol on him the virtues of a service academy life and education, he patiently tolerated me. <laughs> and during the walking and the pointing, and at the end of the tour, I asked him, well, what do you think? And he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, I've been in the Army for the last 18 years, and I didn't like it all that much. <laughs> or, or words to that effect. Fair enough, I thought. He is now a successful college professor, a great husband, and a model dad. No father could ask for more. We are so glad to have Maura in our family. She is a wonderful woman, a loving wife to Scott, a so-so board game player, uh, and a great mother to Penelope. West Point class of 2039, <laughs> who has quickly become the light of all of our lives. We're glad to have more as mom and dad, uh, Phil and Joe Ellen Mannix, in our lives. Unfortunately, they're, they're not here today because of a death in their family, but we're glad that Uncle John Bush is, uh, is here representing uh, uh, the Mannix clan. So thanks, thanks very much to them. I know Penelope had to step out. She must have had something else going on today. Um, <laughs> But we look forward to spending more time with her as well. I have endless verses of Baby Shark that I've been working on uh, to entertain her and you with. And with this sweet pension that I'm getting from uh, Uncle Sam here, I will be able to match thread for thread uh, those patriot rags uh, that her parents continue to, to drape on her here with very cool, stylish Vikings fan gear. I look forward to it. Nicholas was our advance man back to St. Paul. He departed Tampa right before New Year's last year. I got a text from him on the 1st of January after he arrived in St. Paul reporting that it was one degree. Literally, that's what, the, that's what the text said. It's one degree. It isn't, I've arrived safely, the car was good, traffic was light, hope you and mom or dad are good. It's one degree. 
Through my decades of military experience and my finely honed ability to deduce and grasp um, uh, the, the, the nuanced aspects of any situation, I sensed that he may have been rethinking his decision. <laughs> Hashtag, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> After weathering the polar vortex in the toughest Minnesota weather since 1966, on 8 March, he texted me again that weather was above freezing today. <laughs> Hashtag, I might survive this. <laughs> a week later, he reported the temperature hit 51 degrees. Hashtag, I got this. Well done, Nick. I, have, I hope you have fun driving the best car ever back to the Great White North this weekend, our classic and highly coveted Land Rover Discovery, which many people have tried to buy from me, but which I have refused to sell, which you helped me pick out, and then more importantly, helped convince a reluctant mother that we absolutely had to have it. You were the closer on that deal, my friend. Well done, wingman. Your mom and I are so proud of, of all of you. Thanks for being here today. I grew up in a big family led by Hank and Pat Votel, now long gone, but who instilled in us a love of family, pride in country and community, and support for each other. No one had it better than my siblings and me. Our mom stayed home every day of her life and was a vital aspect of every part of our lives. School, church, sports, friends, even dating, and our eventual transition into adulthood. She took special pride in how she raised her ornery pups, as she frequently referred to us. Other kids always came to our house because it was a fun and welcoming place to be. Together, our parents demonstrated to us what was meant by the phrase, for better or worse. Our father, a successful but quiet and reserved businessman who worked hard all of his life, cared for our mother and our family home for the last 15 years of her life while she suffered from the effects of Alzheimer's. For my brothers, sisters, and me, it was a lesson of a lifetime. He passed away six years after our mother did, having lived long enough to see me promoted to Brigadier General. Along the way, my five older brothers and my three younger sisters, a passel of nephews and nieces, uncles and aunts and cousins, have always been there for us, visiting us where we served, attending ceremonies and promotions, and welcoming us back home during our periodic visits to St. Paul. Michelle's mom and dad, Dave and Jean Belair, and their big extended family were equally supportive and encouraged us as we pursued our military career. In the end, it was not a hard decision for Michelle and me to return to Minnesota after our military service. It has hard winters, but it also has a world-class international airport that can take us anywhere we want to go, and the summers are to die for. And it is, after all, where we come from, where our roots are, and where our people live. My military journey began on a spring day in April 1968 when my oldest brother Dick, living with his family in Baltimore at the time, took my dad and mom and my sisters and me to see the Naval Academy. Now, I know my classmates are thinking, what? Hold on here. This is a, this is a self-correcting story. I knew instantly that that's what I wanted to do. And after that visit, I never wanted to do anything else but be in the military. After a few twists and turns, I ended up at West Point, uh, but it all started for me at Annapolis. I think it worked out best for everybody. Like my classmates, I showed up at Mikey Stadium early on the morning of 7 July, 1976, having never seen West Point before and after the quietest bus ride ever from New York City, and immediately wondered what I'd gotten myself into. My first roommates were Santiago Rendon, a Colombian exchange student, a close friend of mine to, to us to this day, sitting right here in front of me, and Ed Wilhelm, who had just come from living in Tehran, Iran, where his father served as a U.S. military attache. Think about that for a moment. I quickly found that there's comfort in collective misery and survived my West Point experience, graduating in the 40th percentile, thereby reinforcing the notion that the Army, or at least CENTCOM, is run by C students. I chose the one and only branch that I was interested in, infantry, and followed a fairly normal career path. Along the way, I met many who influenced my life. My first platoon sergeant, Sergeant First Class Craig Gower, insisted that I demonstrate the right to be a platoon leader. After all, he reminded me, I did have Vietnam vets in my first platoon. And when I had, he was absolutely, absolutely my greatest advocate in ensuring everyone knew that I was now the platoon leader, teaching my, my first and most important lesson in confidence, loyalty, and trust. Every officer needs a sergeant, 
My career was heavily influenced by a phalanx of NCOs who modeled leadership and provided unwavering support along the way. Topped by the NCO we honored yesterday at his retirement, Command Sergeant Major Bill Thetford, who was my sergeant for the last eight years. I was well supported by members of my chain of command who believed the best way you rewarded good work and performance is by providing opportunities to move forward. So I was afforded the opportunity to join the Ranger Regiment and pursue jobs that contributed to a well-rounded career. The Army saw fit to allow me to command not one, but two battalions. I don't know what they were thinking, but I was not about to ask, and it was definitely better the second time around. The most satisfying thing for any commander is to see the young officers and NCOs that you work with as a battalion commander grow up and become successful senior leaders themselves. Virtually every company commander, first sergeant, staff officer, or staff NCO who was in the first Ranger Battalion when I had the honor of commanding it is now a general officer or a sergeant major. I was set up for success. I was fortunate to be in key command positions on 9-11 and was able to have a front row seat to our military response and eventually our initial operations into Iraq. I had the opportunity to transition between the Army and the joint soft community serving in stored units like the 82nd Airborne Division and the Joint Special Operations Command. Following regimental command, I had the opportunity to serve in the Pentagon for three years, where I learned that it is possible to suck and blow at the same time. <laughs> While there, I was assigned an important mission to pull together our department efforts to defeat IEDs. At the time, it was the hardest but most noble thing I'd ever done. But again, I was well supported by the services, by the OSD and joint staffs, and especially the vast science, technology, and acquisition communities of the Defense Department. When I needed help the most, I got it in spades. As the JSOC, SOCOM, and, Mo and CENTCOM commander, I had the opportunity to lead our military efforts in very important areas. But again, any success I achieved was merely reflected glory from those who actually did the hard lifting. The soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen operating at the pointy end of the stick. Commanders and senior enlisted leaders who demonstrated vision and strategic grasp that greatly exceeded mine. Staff officers and NCOs who worked tirelessly to plan, coordinate, and then execute. Dedicated civilians who provided the continu <clears throat> continuity and expertise that underpinned everything we did. My point to all of you is this. I did very little myself. I had great examples set for me. Officers who took a personal interest in me. I worked alongside the cream of the crop and fate often interceded and placed me in positions where I was able to serve in consequential times. No one had it easier than me. Most importantly, I had the opportunity to work for nearly 39 years with the best that our country has to offer, our young men and women. They are magnificent. They and their families have little to gain in their service <clears throat> and with their, uh, they have little to gain with their service and virtually everything to lose but they have left it all on the field for our country. How can you not be successful working with people like that? I am so thankful for having had the opportunity to be in a position to lead them, to support them, and to get to know and love them. The last few months, weeks, and days have been filled with a series of last things, but they also have been filled with a deluge of memories and feelings, most good and some sad. The pride the first time you step in front of a new formation, the esprit to belong into a, an outfit where the collective culture outweighs individual goals, the sense of accomplishment that comes from knowing your actions helped a soldier or his family, the absolute thrill and satisfaction of an operation well executed and a mission accomplished, the agony of a mission or operation going wrong, the loneliness of being away from your loved ones, the profound grief and sadness of losing a close friend in combat, the warmth of that first embrace after a long deployment. The relief when you try to comfort the parents or the spouse of a fallen soldier only to realize that you are the one being consoled. The honor of having served a great country in its time of need. The gratitude for those who have made the path possible. There is a ritual in airborne units when they get ready to jump. You show up at the ramp, you go through pre-jump training, you don your gear, and you stand by for the jump master to make final manifest call. When he does, he clearly states the jumper's last name, and the jumper responds with his first name and middle initial, Votel, Joseph L. I suppose to the casual observer, this is primarily an accountability drill. 
After all, we do want to know who's getting on the aircraft. But for anyone who has actually done this, it is much more. It is an acknowledgement that you are stepping forward, placing your trust and life in the hands of others, an acknowledgement that others are placing their lives in your hands, a demonstration of your commitment to the team, and an agreement to do something completely unnatural for your country. Call me a hopeless romantic, but I always, always love that feeling. I have loved this life, and I have loved those with whom I have been honored to serve. In his second letter to the disciple Timothy, St. Paul writes from prison, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. As my time in uniform comes to an end, as my race finishes, as my fight concludes, I hope that I have been worthy of the support and opportunities that you and so many others have bestowed upon me. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Come visit us in Minnesota. Bring warm clothes. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the playing of the Army song and stay in place until after the departure of the official party and as the Votel family is escorted out of the ballroom. Thank you all for taking the time to honor General Votel and his family. You may offer your congratulations and bid farewell to the Votels after the change of command ceremony that will com commence at 3 p.m. There will be a short intermission as we reset the room for the change of command ceremony. We kindly ask that you gather your personal belongings so we can update the seating arrangements for the next event. Thank you again for attending today's retirement ceremony.